We talk all the time. What's I, I know we talk all the time, but this is for real. This is, <laughs> this is, we're going to share this with the world. So this is Paul and I have a very special guest with me today, Jacob. And I have gotten to know Jacob now oh, over the last oh, little while on the Bridges of Meaning Discord server. What have, you know, I, as I continue to do whatever on earth I am doing, one of the things that I, I, I reflect a lot on what I do and, and, and the kinds of things that it brings up. And it, um, the Bridges of Meaning Discord server is kind of a place to get to know people better. And for me, that's, that's really important because I now know lots more people than I knew three years ago. And, but, but to get to know them in this internet way is sort of like internet famous. And it's, I, I like, I like getting to know people in a little deeper way. And of course, there's only 24 hours in a day. I can only have so much time to get to know people. And one of my real treats has been getting to know Jacob because Jacob has been, um, Jacob has taught me a lot. And we had a conversation before. There are all kinds of technical issues. And so I didn't share it publicly. And uh, maybe we still will. I don't know. But there are all kinds of issues. And so I thought, I, he commented to somebody, he says, well, Paul didn't want to share the first conversation. And I thought, well, we, we got to do this right. So Jacob, this is our chance because I got something that's is all tangled up here now. Um, I, I want it. I want the world to know Jacob a little bit better. And he's taught me a lot. So let's, let's have at it. We're going to start with your story. All my right, Jacob. Story. Your story. And Jacob said, my life's an open book. So I thought, oh boy, <laughs> here we go. Open book awaits. So, Jacob, where were you born and who were you born to? Uh, so I was born on the seventh of tier. I don't actually know the year. <laughs> um, I was born in Iran. So the calendar's different. Um, so uh, tier is uh, the month of cancer, I believe. And the year is like 1300 something in Iran. It's, it's, it's the Muslim calendar. Um, anyway, in Tehran clinic. So, uh, uh, yeah, I was born in Tehran. My parents are my parents. Um, I don't know what to uh, tell you. I mean, we ended up coming to the United States. Uh, I, I originally came here with uh, political asylum. Um, I, I don't want to get too much into everything that happened during the war. I mean, there was a war in Iran and everything. And um, my parents have a lot of undeserved shame and guilt about mm. all of that. Mm. Um, here, I wanted to tell you this story. This is a beautiful story. Um, I'm going to tell you two stories. So my earliest memory was, um, I don't know if you've been to a traditional Jewish service, but prayer service. But um, for everybody who hasn't, the main prayer part is silent. And um, you would be excused for watching one and thinking that Jews worship the Torah scroll. Because the scroll it's reading, it has a very prominent position, right? And my earliest memory um, is my father actually holding me. And there's a part of the prayer service where they lift the scroll for uh, open scroll for everyone to see. And the tradition is you take the fringes of your uh, prayer shawl and you point towards it and you say, Zot HaTorah Asher Sam Moshe Lefnei B'nei Yisrael Torah Tziva Lanu Moshe Marsha Kehilat Yaakov. You'll recognize the word Yaakov at the end of that. So um, my father teaching me to say those words. This is the Torah that Moses uh, taught us. Um, Moses taught us Torah as an inheritance for the uh, congregation of Jacob, right? And uh, my Hebrew name was Jacob. I'm, I had a Persian name as well. Uh, when I came here, um, I changed. So that that's that's the first story. The second story 
my dad told me um, years later when I was in yeshiva, he told me this story. Um, when we left Iran, when we tried to leave the second time, um, my dad had to, because the first time he had gotten caught, he, he had gone to prison. So he had to walk across the border, right? And he told me ever since he was a little kid, he, um, during the evening prayers, we say a psalm of ascents, I raise my eyes, you know, you know that psalm. And he said, ever since he was a little kid, he, he was always bothered by the line. It says, the sun shall not harm you uh, at day and the uh, moon at night. night. And he was always bothered by that line. What does that mean for the moon to hurt you at night? So while he was trying to sneak across the border, he, they were going, um, they were, they were sleeping during the day and they were walking. He walked about three days across the hilly part border of Iran and, and Turkey. They were walking at night and the night they got, they were on top of a hill and they got to basically the, the valley where the border is and he had to get across to the other hill. And um, it, it was a full moon and out in the middle of nowhere. And it, he said, it felt like it was a full day. Hmm. And he 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 literally said he 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 raised his eyes to the mountains, right? Where is my help going to come? Right. And that line, which had bothered him from the evening prayers ever since he was a little kid, always bothered him. And it, it, it all came together. Um, yeah, so that's where I come from. <laughs> that's, that's great. That's great. So you grew up obviously in a, in a household that was observant and, oh, well, okay, well, say more about that. I mean, he obviously knew, he obviously knew the Psalms. He, I mean, he, you, he brought you to um, to participate in the religion of your people. And so you came to America. Did all that keep going or what happened in America? So this is America another... does stop funny things to religious people. Well, it wasn't, it's not just America. You have to realize my father went, um, he left Iran and went to Israel to study in the sixties. And he got his bachelor's degree in engineering in, in Israel. And, um, one more story he told me when I was in yeshiva and I was far more religious and I continue to be far more religious than my parents are comfortable with. In fact, so does my sister. But at the time I was, I was definitely a lot more observant than my parents. My parents were not happy with my level of observance. And um, I spent a year in yeshiva in Israel and my parents came to visit. And my dad told me that when he came to the United States, um, one of these Orthodox schools offered me free tuition so that um, he wouldn't put me in the public school. And he said he went to visit the school and he saw all the kids running around with their yarmulkes and tzitzit, tzitzit you know, hanging out. And he decided, that's not what I want for my son. And he was telling me in Jerusalem while I was studying in yeshiva with a yarmulke and tzitzit, right? Um, so my dad, he, 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 because he knew Hebrew well, he was, and he's the oldest son, he's always been like the rabbi of the family. Like everyone asks him to say the prayers and stuff, but he never wanted me to be more religious than he is. <laughs> and um, so when I was briefly um, the youth rabbi at, at a synagogue, um, my parents wouldn't even come to my synagogue. Wow. Yeah. Wow. So why did you wind up more religious than your father? 
you know, I was one, I, so I don't have much patience with hypocrisy. Um, if you believe it, you believe it. If you don't believe it, you don't believe it, right? And I was talking to Richard um, and telling him about my childhood and it suddenly dawned on me. Um, I read, I read Crime and Punishment when I was 12. And I don't even remember it. But it, I loved it so much. I immediately read um, Brothers Karamazov and um, the, uh, the Prince and uh, Anna Karenina. And like, I started on this whole Russian you know, literature kick. Uh, That's pretty young for that literature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I don't really remember it. Uh, you know, I want to, now that, I mean, Jordan Peterson talks so much about it, especially Dostoevsky. Yeah. Um, I wonder if that's why I never bought into the nihilism. You know, like I remember reading Camus and, you know, in, in school with it. And I always found it to be completely worthless. I really did. Um, it was like, if, so I don't believe in atheists. I don't. <laughs> um, and, and when Jordan Peterson said like, there are lots of people who say they're atheists, but they don't act like it, right? I, I've agreed with him about that forever, right? Um, and, and maybe that is like, that's been ingrained in me all the way back from like when I was 12 and Dostoevsky, mm. Mm. but, um, yeah, I, I don't believe in atheists and like it, the whole concept, okay, you're, you're going to tell me there's no God of any sort then why do I get it out of bed in the morning? <laughs> like, what does it matter? Like, why does anything matter? Um, just wasn't my thing. Like, it, and, and so I remember, um, I actually remember this vividly because I was a freshman in college and I was at the computer labs and I was typing an email to my friends and I, I like did a decision tree, right? Do I believe in God? Yes or no? Yes. Do I believe in an intelligent God? Yes. Do I believe that God wants certain things from me? Yes. Do I know what that is? Not really. But I figured God must have, if, if God wants me to know him, then he must have given me clues. And so that memory of my father teaching me, this is the Torah that Moses, and now that I understand the whole ceremony behind it, right? Every single Saturday and actually every three days in a synagogue, two people stand up and they read the of the torah and they say this is the torah that uh, that moses taught us and it is a testimony for generations and um that is the testimony of my fathers so i i everything else has been a um everything else i learned right? Um, anything else about God has, that's the, that's the measuring stick, right? The, the five books of Moses, the Torah, that is the measuring stick. If, if it, if it goes along with that, then yes, I will accept it. And if it doesn't, bye, goodbye, no way. That's, and that's been the foundation of my religion, 
religious journey my whole life, I guess. So how how'd you wind up in Israel in yeshiva? How did that what what happened there? You obviously weren't pushed there by your father. <laughs> no, I mean so I guess uh, I guess I this is where I, I I start talking about the Rebbe. So Rebbe is um, is Yiddish for Rabbi, but it's it's more familiar. And Hasidim, so in in Hasidic, there's always a leader, um, oftentimes translated as the Grand Rabbi, um, which is kind of weird because you're translating what is, you know, a familiar term, Rebbe. It's, it's, Rebbe is less, is more familiar than Rabbi, right? Mm -hmm. But you translate it as Grand Rabbi. Um, so um, the Rebbe of Chabad, um, the seventh Lubavitcher Rebbe, Rabbi Menachem Mendel Schneerson, he revolutionized Judaism um, during his, um, I mean, he, he's, he has almost single-handedly, certainly a continuation of things that previous Hasidic rabbis, like Hasidism, people don't realize Hasidism is only 300 years old. And it's, uh, it's been a revivalist movement that started with Rabbi Israel ba Baal Shem Tov 300 years ago. And it has caught fire to the point where now um, it's kind of funny, but like people think, okay, you hear Hasidic Jew, you think these are the most orthodox, you know, these... These are the people who are keeping everything exactly as it was a thousand years ago. And it's like, yes and no. It's, it's, it's a revivalist movement, um, which certainly bases itself on tradition. But at the same time, um, and this is, I mean, it's kind of funny. Um, it, it, in a way, it's not. I mean, it's yes, it 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 seeks to revivify Judaism, and it has to a great extent. Um, and honestly, I mean, after World War II, a lot of people thought Orthodox Judaism was dead. And um, Orthodox Judaism today is the only really living parts of, uh, you know, the only, well, it's not, it's not a very good denomination as a denomination, but it's the only one that's still a lot, that's, yeah. that I would say has a fire to it. That's alive. Yeah. Um, it's, it, it's, it, yeah. it's interesting that we've seen this in Christianity, you know, with, with what we'd call fundamentalism in the united states we've seen it in islam i remember you know after the first world war a lot of people thought islam was had had it but these very conservative movements in and you know we use this word conservative it's probably these what word to use these and these very not, energetic movements that are looking back to bring the back into the present it's not reactionary that's that's the important part this is why I use the term revivalist, right? A, reviv a revivification is not a reactionary. Right. I, we're not seeking to go back. I, I'm not seeking to go back. Um, I think this is where the, the reactionaries get everything wrong, right? Um, I'll tell you another story. So I asked my grandmother, um, she died a year or two ago. Now my grandmother, she spoke Aramaic. That was her first language, it was Aramaic. And 
um, you know, I, I asked her about her life growing up and she grew up literally on the, on, on the um, rivers of Babylon, literally. Like her brother, when, he, he's living in Jerusalem. He feels that that Psalm has been his life because they literally went from living in a small little village on the rivers of Babylon to Jerusalem. And my grandmother told me when she was a kid, what she and all the women folk did all day was um, cook and uh, take the dishes down to the river to, to wash them and bring them back. So, and take the clothes down to the river and wash them and bring it, bring them back. And when she moved, she finally moved to a place where there was soap and running hot water and a kitchen and electricity. She told me she felt like it was it, like, the world had completely changed for her. And because of that, when people told her that a lot of the old ways, you know, the, these are ancient ways, like keeping separate meat and milk dishes. She's like, well, I mean, we're washing them in hot water. That's kind of like koshering them in between, right? Um, so for her, it, it she, she just felt like she was in such a different world that she, she just left all the old ways behind. And I don't, I'm not seeking to go back and live like the Amish, you know, on, on, on the rivers of, of Babylon. I'm looking forward, as you know, <laughs> To the Messiah. <laughs> um, and that, that is a better world than my grandmother lived in. Mm -hmm. Not, not, I'm not looking to go back to like a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago. I'm looking forward to the Messiah and the messianic age. And honestly, nothing would be more heaven for me than to be able to live a life like I did that year I was in yeshiva, hmm. where morning, I, I get up in the morning, I go to prayers, I can pray, I can spend the whole day on Talmud. When, when we were in yeshiva, we used to joke, like Talmud, like breaking your head on a piece of Talmud, we used to joke, it's like a smack habit, habit. like, that's that was the that was the sign we had for let's go back to to Talmud. It was right because that's what it feels like to break your head on a piece of Talmud, right? Um, if I could do that for the rest of my life and nothing else, heaven, geschmack, you know, in Yiddish, it's geschmack. Right. Um, it's it's I've, I've never done drugs, but I that's that's what I imagine. Like when. Like I not no other intellectual, you know, thing I've ever done has been like this, where like there's this text and you're trying to understand it and there's thousands of years of commentaries, right? There's Rashi and there's Tosfot and there's Maimonides and there's, and you're just trying to understand like this one line. We would spend 30, 40 hours on like 10 words, right? And uh, it's partner learning. So you're sitting there, you're arguing it like, it means this, it means that, but Rashi says this and Tosfot says that. And then, and then it breaks like ice breaking. And 
happen. So, yeah. So when the Messiah comes, you know, that's that's what I imagine heaven's going to be like. Well, you're 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 not doing that now. What happened? I mean, an open book. I'm not getting a lot of open book here. I get I get, I love the stories, but you know, you you somehow got from being raised in a family that your father didn't want you to be too orthodox all the way over into yeshiva and then and then now you're sitting in this office and I meet you on a on a Discord. Hang on, someone just came to the door. I'm going to pause the video. Okay. Who knows what's going on? All right, here we go. All right, sorry. So you have all these transitions and 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 you told us what you want to do. And, you know, here we are today. I didn't meet you because I traveled to Israel and you were, you know, living the, li you were living the dream. So you, you got to fill in, got to fill me in on some stuff here. It's not about what I want to do. Oh, it's getting even more interesting. Honestly, like if, if God wanted me to uh, sit there studying Talmud all day, then he would have created me sitting there, you know, it's, it's funny. Um, Brett Weinstein on his, uh, he had a Facebook group that he was a little active on. And once he wrote a comment, like, I feel like my whole life has been a preparation for this moment. You know, like it's, it's all prepared him. And he's like, it strangely prepared me for the for what happened at Evergreen, and I, and my response was, "How do atheists say such things?" <laughs> Jordan Peterson should be laughing his head off when they say such things. I know, I know, I know. <laughs> um, and honestly, I mean. There were several places where I could have taken a very different turn and I would likely be in a very different place. But um, at any one time, I have the knowledge that I have and God has given me the capacities that I have and I have to put all of them to the best use in making the world, right? God's kingdom down on earth as it is in heaven. Well, um, well I want to, I want to connect some dots here because I, you know, we're, we're, we're leaving the, we're leaving the listeners and, and you're, you're, I, we don't see any, we don't see any of this. Yeah. Um, what happened? You you do you did you leave that community? Do you are you a are you a I mean what what's going on? I mean I I even asked you just for my own because I've you know gotten pieces of your story, but I mean what do you believe now? Why aren't you? I I assume you're not a a, a regular member of that community. What communities are you a regular member of? How can we locate you on the map right now? Who are you? <laughs> I am not a regular member, although, um, like, if if you were to ask me who my rabbi is, um, it's still Rabbi Wagner, who is the the Rebbe's emissary to USC, which is where I went to college, where, um, and he is still, you know, I I. <laughs> It's funny. Um, he he certainly disagrees with me on a lot of stuff, but it's it's hard to look. I know Rabbi Wagner. I have lived with him kind of like I I know him and I know I have seen miracles I'm not joking miracles 
holy, holy person. Um, but ultimately, that wasn't the life that God wanted for me. Um, it's So many different things happened, and some of them I can't explain. Some of them are very personal, but I never lost the idea that the reason why I'm sitting here in this chair is because ultimately that was God's decision that I be sitting here within this chair and using this computer as opposed to the other one that has a camera that doesn't work. And that camera doesn't work because that's what God wants. You sound very Calvinist. Um, so... Not at all. <laughs> the, the, this the, this was actually the big fight between the Hasidim and their opponents 300 years ago was uh, what's called Hashkacha uh, Pratit, whether divine providence is at the level of what mouse is sitting here. Wow. 300 years ago, huh? He, well, that was the fight. Yeah, the, that's very the fight, interesting. The fight got really ugly. The fight got really, really ugly. Yeah, the, the, the Senate of Dort didn't didn't get unugly either. So, <laughs> and that was about four hundred years ago. So it's very interesting. It's very interesting to me. So, okay, it's God's will that you be here, but again, the we don't have a lot of people like you in the Bridges of Meaning Discord. We've got a we've got a bunch of people who um, are really interested in. Um, in orthodoxy and not Jewish orthodoxy. Eastern orthodoxy, <laughs> which I have to say, and I say this on, on the uh, server a lot, like a lot of things I thought was Christianity, original sin, right? Um, the, the egalitarian trinity. Um, the, there, there have been many things like this. Like I... I uh, penal substitutionary atonement. Like, I thought that was Christianity. And I find out it's Western Christianity. The Eastern Orthodox don't believe in original sin. They believe in ancestral sin, which I think is still wrong, but not as wrong. Um, they, they believe in a monarchical trinity, which it's still wrong, but not as wrong. Um, and uh, they believe in a different, like they have a different concept of, of Jesus' atonement, which again, they're wrong, but not as wrong. Um, so, I mean, I ended up on, on your server because um, Jordan Peterson was somebody who was helping me clean up my life. Mm. Um, so I, you know, I consider myself a devotee of Jordan Peterson and Eric Weinstein and you um, in a very similar manner as I consider myself a devotee of uh, the Lubavitcher Rebbe and Rabbi Wagner and other people who I feel are actually making the world a better place. And it becomes a question of what capacity do I have to contribute to the good work that's being done, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What are my capabilities? And um, when it comes to teaching Judaism, I'm at the back of the, right. I. We I've should plug finished. your YouTube channel. You do have a YouTube channel. I do, yes. I have a YouTube channel. But, so I have one tractate of the Talmud to my name. Hundreds of thousands of people are on the daily Talmud, which finishes the, the entire Talmud every seven and a half years. 
I have no capacity for that. Um, I do have the capacity to teach uh, the Hebrew alphabet and uh, T for tech last week. Mm -hmm. I taught him to read Hebrew. He, he can read Hebrew now. Mission accomplished. <laughs> Seriously. I love it. I love it. I know. I Because I, I heard you two going at it on the Discord. I thought, oh, this is fascinating. This is interesting. I can't hey. use that word fascinating. People say, use that word too much. It's okay. But it's, I'm interested. So It's funny. I've been watching a lot of the master's seminary classes on YouTube. Um, oh, boy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're gonna have to then explain that one <laughs> i don't know if i can where's uh where's preston sprinkle when we need him um, preston sprinkle preston sprinkle i just got i've just got another one of his books i'm going to do another conversation with him about his he he is a writer he went to master's seminary and um He's we we have a conversation. We have a couple of conversations on the channel. He went to master seminary. It, religious, you know, this is this is something that's hard, and you and I both understand this. But religious communities and their interrelationships are so complex, and there are all these little rivalries and discomforts and bigotries and this, you know, there's all this stuff going on between them. So, masters is, you know, they're, they're they they're sort of clumped up in the reformed category, but a lot of us think they're not really, they're sort of these weird dispensationalist American things and not, they're not the real deal. So, <laughs> well, I mean, so their, um, their, their history. I mean, I, I, I watched two semesters of theological history. I binge watch things. And um, I mean, obviously he had his bent, but what he was talking about was, you know, God's word. Yeah, yeah, you, you put your faith in God's word. God's word changes the world. You don't change the world. Right. I don't change the world. Right, 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 right. right. So if, if I'm teaching, like in, in my uh, videos, I'm just teaching people how to use the various internet tools that are available, which miraculously are available. And I do believe this is a miracle. Um, did you get a chance to read that section of Maimonides I sent you? No. When did you send it to me? <laughs> I, I, I direct messaged it to you. Um, so uh, there's, a, there's a small section of Maimonides that was uh, censored until very recently because it talks about Jesus. And um, now that, you know, the internet being what it is, um, so people have started publishing uncensored versions. And Who censored it? The Catholics. Oh, okay. Um, so <laughs> this, is, this is actually pretty funny. You know the standard uh, Talmud ed editions that we have and what's called the rabbinic Hebrew Bible, the Mikraot Gedolot? They were all published by a Catholic printer uh, first time. Like he, he had a staff of some very prominent rabbis and he got permission from the Pope to print the first actual printings of the the Talmud and the rabbinic Bible. And um, yeah, so I mean, the Maimonides, Maimonides, his uh, Mishnah Torah, I usually translate that as restatement of the law. Um, that was that was censored by the Catholic censors. Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I mean, it, it would have been prudent for the Jews to censor it themselves because, um, most Christians probably would disagree with what Maimonides has to say about Jesus. Um, but, um, 900 years ago, 
Maimonides said that um, he believed the reason why uh, Jesus and that Ishmaelite, he means Muhammad, yeah. um, were able to do everything they're able to do was because they would spread the concept of God and monotheism mm. and the Messiah all over the world. He, he says, and this is before the discovery of the new world, to the furthest islands. Mm. And so when the Messiah comes, everyone will be familiar with these concepts. They'll realize the Christians and Muslims are completely wrong and <laughs> and uh, and understand the truth right right uh, and while i do think he was absolutely prophetic i don't i'm not so egotistical to think that the, there might not be some things that i need to realize that possibly i've gotten wrong so far um and so i mean where I got my interest in Christianity became based on that Maimonides. Um, that section of Maimonides was, well, so I know enough about Judaism to provide context to the things that Jesus says uh, to people who want to hear that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, when when people... And which led me to actually trying to read and understand what Jesus said, because I'm used to, if, if I, I ask Rabbi Wagner something and we have a disagreement, I, ha it, I have yet to actually win a debate with him, <laughs> right? Uh, he, he's only two years older than me, but um, he's like, you know, when it comes down to it, he knows everything pat. And when he says it's X and I'm thinking it's Y and we pull out the sources, it's X. Because <laughs> he actually knows his stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, he knows Judaism almost as well as people on the server think I do. I know. <laughs> um, but so my, my feeling had always been, you know, the Christians understand Jesus better than, than I do. So when a Christian tells me that Jesus said he was God, I figured Jesus must have said he was God. Um, I've, I've changed my mind on that. Well, well, let's, let's, let's move over to Jesus now. And because you've, I mean, you've, you've shared a bunch of stuff with me and, and I've, I've valued your presence on the server and, um, you, you've shared some really interesting perspectives that you've had on Jesus with me on his Messiah ship. Why don't you... Talk about that a little bit, as I had never heard any of that before until until you brought it out. It's like, oh, well, that's interesting. So I looked up some of that stuff. Okay, so I'm not trolling. I'm not trolling. And like people will say he's trolling. I'm not trolling. Um, Christian comes from the word Christos, which means anointed which is the translation of the word Mashiach, Messiah. I don't see a lot of messianism in Christianity. I don't. I this, when you told me this the first time, I thought, well, oh, this is fascinating. And so what is, what is messianism for you? I mean- Looking forward to the coming of the Messiah. Oh, okay, what is the Messiah to you? The Messiah is the fulfillment of prophecy, of okay. God's prophecy, of God's kingdom on earth. The Melech HaMashiach, the king who is anointed by God and God's kingdom being here. 
this being God's kingdom, the end to suffering, the end to, uh, you know, that that it should no longer be be necessary for me to say to you, know God, because we should we will all know God and right as the waters cover the sea and and Stefania three nine I um I I I quote it on uh I quote it at the end of each of my videos right I I will I will the the Hebrew word is very interesting it's uh, comes from the root to turn over right I will turn over a Barura, a, a winnowed language, and so that all the nations will be able to call in the name of God with literally one shoulder, right? So the 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 fulfillment of God's wishes on earth, heaven on earth, not heaven on earth right um and honestly like if christians talk about the coming of jesus it's with trepidation maybe <laughs> yes you're right you're right no nobody's look nobody's looking forward to it and all the hollywood movies have it trying to forestall the apocalypse which is of course the apocalypse is the revelation and the revelation of who? It's the revelation of the Son of Man. It's the revelation of it's the second coming. It's all those things. No, you're quite right. And this is what's this is what's fascinating to me about you is because the points you are making are are so. I mean, you're looking, you're watching Christians from the outside, and you know the text, and you know the story from you know from the Hebrew scriptures, and you're watching them, and you're like, what's with you? And then you read the Gospels, and you know, the Gospels are this, I mean, to me, what those Gospels are was Jesus' attempt to redefine that term because everyone expected a certain thing out of him, including John the Baptist, apparently, from Matthew 11, and Jesus doesn't deliver. And Jesus does this other thing with it, which then sets up, I think, the the heart of your, your question about to the degree that Christians are messianic or not. And so all of those, all of those tensions and ambiguities are right there in what you say. And I simply love it that you bring them and you say, What are you people doing? I think that's exactly right, because I think it makes it makes the tensions in in the New Testament Gospels come alive to a church that in many ways is sort of doesn't know what it's doing, but is going through some certain motions that it has been set on instead of actually stopping and asking the kinds of really important challenging questions that you've been asking Christians in the server. That's part of the reason I, I love watching you do what you do there because it's a it's a breath of fresh air for someone who has been in the church forever, because you don't come, you know, sometimes, sometimes people sort of forest gump in some, some fresh air where they just ask the obvious thing. And, and it's, you know, it's the obvious thing, but you come with, you come with a, a degree of knowledge and preparation of a certain angle that many don't have. And so when I watch you challenging and asking questions and, and I, I see it as a very helpful, I see it as a very helpful contribution to the community. So I agree with you that I think, I think God's got you exactly where you should be. <laughs> Amen. 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 But, but of course we're coming at this from, you know, sort of different places. And that was part of the reason why once I heard, learned a little bit of your story, it's like, well, what's he doing here? And the more I watch you here, the the more delighted I am by it because, because of all the ways that you are challenging Christians and non-Christians and atheists and the whole menagerie of folks that are in this strange little community to you know, to, to think, to think about the text, 
in a serious way. And so, and I, you know, I, as a, as a Protestant minister, that's one of the real, that's one of the things I want people to do. I want people to think about the text in a serious way. And you prompt them to do it because you ask uncomfortable and difficult questions, just like your point about, you know, you're, and Debbie, the, the first time you told me that, I, I just found it, you're not very messianic. What's wrong with you? I, I thought, oh, this is delightful. Um, so I don't know. So I, I love what you're doing and I want you to keep doing it. Thank you. Well, I hope, I mean, I hope what I'm doing is, is like, because, you know, I, I, I certainly have my doubts, right? Um, there are definitely people who are not happy that I am there. There are people who have uh, asked for me to be kicked off the server. <laughs> um, there are times when I wonder if it's not better not to um, poke people in their axioms so hard. Um, I haven't seen you do it so hard. I mean, you're, you're just asking questions and, and who you are and where you're coming from you know, for yet and again, people on the server don't like it when you share your opinion of the Apostle Paul, and I. But I, I don't. I, I'm just. I'm very. I'm a very strange person. The, for, the further I get in this, the further I realize how strange I am. But maybe I'm just. A, maybe I'm just a very deep iconoclast. But for you to to make the kinds of challenges you do forces people to well what do i believe well why why should why should we look at this book that has here you got these four synoptic gospels which are you know three of them obviously bear from a similar root and then the gospel of john oh boy and then all these other joanine books oh boy and then paul of tarsus and for you to level the kinds of challenges you do i i think that helps people to say, well, wait a minute. I what what are the reasons that that we think Paul is helpful and important? I find you have that. I find you have that. Um, I find you prompt me in that way, and I find it forces me to pay more attention, be a little less sleepy, and be a little sharper. So I think you do me a service. Because now when I say stuff, I've got you, you know, you've colonized one little member of my consciousness parliament and about the apostle Paul. And, and I've got to deal with that little fella sometimes. And that's, that's good for me. Well, I mean, that's, that's what Jordan Peterson said about people speaking the truth without fear and being able to provoke and be provocative. Um, and honestly, I mean, what I have found, and again, I believe this is m miraculous because I do believe we are approaching the coming of the Messiah, um, is that scholarship is actually, you know, coming along in ways like a lot of the things that I am a very unique person in believing. Um, very prominent scholars of Christianity in the past 20 to 40 years yes. have been writing. Um, I mean, I, I just discovered, um, what was his name? I, I have Robert Eisenman. Yeah, Robert Eisenman. He, um, so he, he, I believe, has cracked the Paul nut, the Paul of Tarsus nut, because um, what was absolutely clear to me was that Paul's story made no sense whatsoever. Hmm. And I have a very hard time reading Paul because um, 
honestly, he just he he says things which are so not Jewish. They're um they 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 hit me in in all those moral taste buds Jonathan Hyde talks about. <laughs> um and uh he he has a theory of Paul um and that that suddenly so really makes a lot of sense to me um that he that Paul was actually Herod's grandson that sounds like Oak Island keep going <laughs> um and he bases it on I mean I mean there there is apparently one line where Paul says uh in one of his letters he says send my greetings to my kinsman Herodotus or something um and so and now that story right somebody who i don't believe ever had a jewish education claiming to be a pharisee of pharisees having the wealth and power that he did because the story my my problem with the story of him going to damascus was that the high priest didn't have the authority to send him to Damascus. And there's no way the high priest would have sent a Pharisee to Damascus. Now, Prince Saulus, which Josephus speaks of, uh, uh, of a Herodian um, named Saulus who was, who was persecuting Jews, not Christians, um, Prince Solus could very well have gone to Damascus because it was an uncle of his who was tetrarch at the time there. Um, and like, so a lot, and his Roman citizenship and the fact that not just that he was a Roman citizenship citizen, but that the guards believed him when he claimed it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Which is always a really, you know, why did they, I'm a Roman citizen. Everybody's a Roman citizen. No, why did you believe? And then they all get into all these questions about how could he prove it, yada, yada, yada. But they did. Um, yes. And and they sent an escort of 470 men. That You don't send for just anybody. No, no. Um, so if, and he's actually like, I did like identified. Um, so uh, Herod's second wife, Mariamne, was Maccabee, right? So she was the last of the Maccabees. She had two sons, two daughters. Herod killed her, his two sons with her. Um, I forget what happened to the elder daughter, but apparently, so I haven't, I haven't gotten into his all of his stuff yet but his so his he seems to believe that paul was adopted into the family of the younger daughter hmm. and he bases the adoption on the fact that paul was named solace right um and not one of the traditional names in the family I'd never heard of this guy or this theory, but it's very interesting. I'm just looking at his I, Wikipedia I just, page. Very I interesting. just recently discovered it. Huh. Yeah. Uh, so he he wrote a book in which he kind of goes through this in 2006. And apparently it's it's made a lot of waves. Um, because he it's it's a very strong argument. Hmm. Prince Prince Solace could have and would have done all of the things Paul claims in ways that I, I it's obvious he was never a Pharisee. I'm sorry. <laughs> but no, that, that's just not a, that's not, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, this is, I mean, 
New Testament studies, the interest in Second Temple Judaism has been over the last couple of over the last few decades, sort of the exciting spot in in New Testament studies. And because obviously there are more there's more and more stuff being dug up and worked on and thought about and and that's going to change to the you know obviously in the church there's this trickle down theory thing because you've got all these scholars out there and they're all court sort of sorted in terms of well where do they stand with respect to touch points of orthodoxy and then they write commentaries and and professors read those commentaries and professors teach students and so you know there's this whole ecosystem that all this stuff sort of gets worked in and so it's not it's it's very very interesting stuff and of course all of that happens while the astounding dynamics of the church itself moves where there's political actors and i mean it's it's just i mean the it, just like one human being is too much for any of us other human beings to really fully understand including the human being that we ourselves are i mean these things just get crazy complex and huge out there and so uh, i you know here again so so you just brought up another thing which to me is like oh look at this some a new name for me to scratch my head about and uh, another theory another theory because you know anyone so i get frustrated as a minister because there is in the ministerial profession an obvious desire for <laughs> for the sheep to um for the sheep to be non-player characters in the church the minister says it the sheep believe it the minister decrees it the sheep obey it i mean all of us want that kind of thing out of the people that are in our lives to a degree and but if you're i mean i guess this is part of what i appreciate about protestantism that there is within protestantism i'm not saying there isn't in the other in the other rooms in in the mansion there is in protestantism a, a desire to continue to go back to the text to continue to go back and say okay well what does this mean and and what that forces you to do is to to always be critiquing the tradition through which you learned the text and the tradition that has that has surrounded the text and critique that tradition that's deep in Protestant DNA. And that that leaves openings for for lots of things, even though with any with any with every religious tradition, openings are sort of anxiety points because something might come in that disturbs the the church and the tradition and all of these things. And th th this is basic. To me, this is basic religious sociology, always dependent on the the aspects of the religion. So, I I find these kinds of conversations stimulating because there are always loose ends in the text that you you never know enough. And so you'll read something and it'll be like, well, how does this fit with that? And then you have to work on that. And now we're sort of back to where we began in this conversation of what you okay. enjoy. Oh, oh, I hit something. Oh, let's hear it. Yeah, you did. So where's God in this? Oh, yeah. I, I, I think God is, I think God is drawing us to himself. Okay. So I believe that, for instance, it wasn't just by luck that the Dead Sea Scrolls are, were discovered, how they were discovered, and they are making huge waves in Christianity. I, I think Google Translate exists not for, I, I don't think the internet was made for porn. <laughs> uh, I, I think Google Translate exists so that people who don't speak Hebrew can can study the the Hebrew Bible. Yeah, yeah. Um, I believe that God is moving in through our history. That there's a narrative, that there was a creation, and there there is a terminus that we're heading towards. So if if you're just trying to preserve your garden. 
how, how are you participating in God's building of his kingdom? Well, and that's why you shouldn't just be trying to preserve your garden. And that's why I'm saying that's it. That is for certain ministers a rather that that is in a sense the corruption, a corruption of their calling. You are to preserve your tribe in that this is something that's been entrusted to you. And when the master returns, you ought to not only give him the tribe you had, but show the increase of the work that you've done within the tribe to him. And so the, the job is to is to take the little church and 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 participate in the work of the Holy Spirit to make them better, to in, to increase them, to um, make them shine. So, and and there's always there's always within this. I really have to track track down this Jordan Peterson quote because he said it so perfectly at one point. Because to there's always a dynamic between change and not change. You know, okay, we're not going to change because change is 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 dangerous. Yes, but not change is dangerous. So you're always in the middle of that and you're always trying to figure out, okay, stuff is always changing around us. What must we change? What must we preserve? What must we improve? And so we're always in that dynamic. And so I, and as a Protestant, we keep coming back around to the text and saying, okay, this is the situation we find ourselves in. This is the word of God that's been given to us how do we, how do we, how do we make this work? How do we obey? How do we believe? How do we live this out? How does this, how does this word become manifest in our community and in our lives? That's, that's a, in a sense, the Protestant ethos, at least as I understand it. So, okay. Within Judaism, we have this idea of the revelation of Sinai, the, the five books of Moses, and then we have progressive, you know, then the prophets come and again, revivify, right? Enliven, right? And the rabbis generation to generation, you know, are, are refining our, and so there is the constant, it's called chidush right which means uh it it means new but it also means month hmm. right so like that renewal that cyclical renewal that moves forward what's the new right? moon isn't it yeah yeah because it's the month it's new yeah. and it's, it's the yeah. new moon i mean it's yeah that's what we're doing that's what that that is what we're doing and so while the Torah of Moses will never change, um, it is eternal. It is what everything else is based on, right? I don't have any problem whatsoever with, for instance, Rabbi Isaac Luria 500 years ago revealing the Kabbalah, which... Um, I believe miraculously has spread and taken over all of Judaism or Rabbi Israel Baal Shem Tov 300 years ago, revealing his teachings, the, the Torah of the Baal Shem Tov, which I believe in, right? Um, or the Rebbe who died in 1994, um, I, I, I believe he could have been the Messiah. I, I never knew him during his life, but even watching the videos of him, I see the prophecy in him. Um, he's the one who made Hanukkah Hanukkah. Hmm. Hanukkah was, was a tiny little holiday nobody knew about before the Rebbe said, no, we're, you know, and, and based based very much in the Talmud and the codes and stuff, right? But from that basis, he made a campaign. And this, this it started in the 50s when, when the Rebbe first became Rebbe. Um, you know, every it was right after World War II. And the, Jew, the Jewish establishment was on this, okay, we need, we need to, keep you know religion out of public life 
And, you know, so the whole religion, Jewish establishment, Orthodox reform, secular, ev everybody was against. And the Rebbe said, no, we, 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 need, we need to bring, have public menorah lightings. Hmm. And, um, and he took it all the way to the Supreme Court. Hmm. He did. And the reason why you can have uh, nativity scenes along with uh, Hanukkah uh, displays. If the Rebbe hadn't done the Hanukkah display, go, go and look at the Supreme Court's uh, decision. The, so they, they were, so there were multiple cases. There was the case of a nativity scene and the case of a Hanukkah display. And the Supreme Court said, no, the nativity scene is establishment and the Hanukkah display is not. So without the Rebbe, the Rebbe's Hanukkah display, which, I mean, you, you look at the amicus briefs, the people who were against the Rebbe's amicus briefs, they, um, it, it's the Jewish establishment. It's, <laughs> it's, it's the entirety of of American Jewry filing amicus briefs against this Hanukkah lighting precisely because of the nativity scene. Interesting. And, and the Rebbe was like, no, 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 this country was founded on God. And, and he, he was really into this. He's like, this country was founded on the idea people came here to practice their religion. And, um, he, he took the, that to the ut, utmost. He was a he was a big proponent of uh, a moment of silence in schools. Um, he constantly talked about how even on 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 U.S. dollars it says in God we trust. And he's like that's why the America is rich. That's why, right? Because in um, in God we trust, right? And um, I mean, the only thing I just hate the fact that we don't have someone like the Rebbe, hmm. like leading us the way he did. Hmm. Um, and the, just la a couple of months ago, uh, we lost both Rabbi Jonathan Sachs and Rabbi Adin Ste Steinsaltz, um, who uh, were both actually very close to the Rebbe, got guidance from the Rebbe, and um, were, were very innovative at the prodding of the Rebbe. Adin Steinsaltz, Evan Israel, he, he translated the, the Talmud to English. Um, and now the entirety of the Talmud is available in English on the internet. Wow. Because of Rabbi uh, Steinzaltz, Evan Israel, um, it was it was a monumental task, and there were a lot of people who weren't happy about that either. Huh. Um, you know, a, a lot of people were like, "No, we we shouldn't," because we've had enough trials of the Talmud, and we've had enough people, you know trying to find every everything they hate about it, right? And um, look, you, you can get, you can buy, you can, there are secular biographies of the Rebbe. They all read like hagiographies because that's the life that he lived. Hmm. And um, I, I have to believe there's somebody out there who is, is ready to pick up that mantle and to be the Messiah. Um, and I believe that. And I'm looking, it's, it's funny. Um, I, I forget who said it. Uh, I quoted a lot. He's like, if the Jews didn't constantly have false messiahs, if, if there weren't constantly Jews saying, this is the Messiah, that he is the Messiah, right? Then 
then we wouldn't then Jews wouldn't seriously be be on the lookout for the Messiah, right? Because if if you're seriously like, you know, the way social justice warriors are looking for racism, if you're looking for the Messiah, you, you you're gonna you, you're gonna find it somewhere wrong somewhere, right? Um, and that that's that's a key point, right? So this is another thing. Like I I, I tell people, I, I I recently found out that Christians don't really believe Jesus is the Messiah. Because when, when you say to a Jew, Jesus is the Messiah, what you're saying is the Messiah, Messianic era is here and he's the one who's, right? And uh, Sam taught me the word preterist, which I've been throwing around. And, <laughs> and, and he says, he says uh, because I genuinely, I, I thought all Christians were preterists because I thought, you know, because that's the ones who come talk to Jews are constantly, well, Jesus fulfilled the prophecies. And I look around me and I'm like, how are they fulfilled? Yeah. They, yeah. yeah. That, and that right. was, and that was, I mean, again, if you go back to Matthew 11, the disciples of John go to Jesus and they say they, they have exactly that question. They, they go to Jesus and they say, ah, uh, uh, it, it isn't it isn't looking fulfilled yet, and Jesus' answer might not impress because he says, "Well, the the lame walk and the deaf hear, the blind see, and the good news is preached to the poor." Uh, you know, blessed is every anyone who doesn't stumble on account of me. And but you know, and see, and again, this is this is why your your challenges I think are so refreshing and and helpful to Christians because to me it, it throws it throws the it throws the question back at the text and asked what exactly was Jesus about because and that, that that's something that was very important has been very important in my own formation as a Christian that question what exactly was Jesus about because his behaviors in his behavior in the story and you know and these are these are aspects that i a bunch of questions arose to me that i never heard anybody else ask one of which was now if if i had been executed by if i had been executed by the united states government and the governor of california and the president of the united states had an opportunity to commute or pardon me and they didn't and i went ahead and was executed and i rose from the dead where would i go i you know i I'd, I'd walk up this the i'd walk up the steps of the of the capitol building here in the state of california and i'd say how do you like me now and that doesn't happen. You know, he, he shows up in a locked room to his disciples and he eats a fish. And it's like. I was going to bring that up. Okay. He eats a fish. Yeah. So where is he? So where is Jesus? You, you, you well, that's, tell why, me, that's why you have the Ascension story. No, 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 no. Ascension, Enoch also ascended. Yeah. That's as not did resurrection. Yeah. No, that's well. The ascension is key in terms of the part of the whole story. I mean, because the question then is, well, where is he now? And he seems to pop in and out. Now, okay, you're skeptical. Seems I, I, I really know. gnostic to me. <laughs> <laughs> See, and I, I think, I think it gets, I think it gets exactly to this point of what a Messiah is, because when I read the Gospels. And, and I think when I, when I read the gospels, so much of the kind, con- cause again, I was in college and I was, so I'm okay. I'm away at college. Do I want to be a Christian? I'm in a Christian college, but you know, I'm so deep within a Christian community. It's like, you didn't get any status for being a Christian. Not really. You got more anyway. So, so I read these gospels and it's like, what, what, what are they, why are they writing about 
healing on the Sabbath and the Sabbath observant things. And why he's not answering any questions I care about because most of the messianic questions that, uh, you know, would, would sort of go along the lines of what you're, how to make this world better and fair enough. And Jesus, you know, apart from healing people's illness and all these people went on to die again and multiplying loaves of fishes and all those people went on to be hungry again. What, 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 what does any of that mean? And, but here's the problem. On one hand, you might say, wow, it never really happened. On the other hand, if you say, yeah, it did happen, then what game is he playing? You know, he, he, he lets Peter walk on water and to the best of my knowledge, Peter continued to use a boat anytime he went fishing after that episode. So, so, so what, 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 what game is Jesus really after? But yet at the same time, you have the fact of the matter that this man and his disciples revolutionized the world to a degree that you and I are deep beneficiaries of without us even knowing it. It was, it was part of God's plan. Oh, I agree. And, and, and so then the question is, who is this God and what is his plan? Um, and I would say his plan is a lot closer to Pharisaic Judaism than Christians realize. Um, and, you know, first I said this, then I searched for the answer, not, not for my answer, right? People were saying the Pharisees were didn't like Jesus healing on the Sabbath, which is a silly idea. Um, and because I know the fights of that time, the Talmud is very, very clear on the fights at the time about healing on the Sabbath. And there, there were a lot of fights. And the Sadducees were calling the Pharisees Sabbath desecrators because they were healing on the Sabbath. And that was not a light charge to, to give, right? Um, and so go ahead, Google, did, did the Pharisees, uh, did the Pharisees challenge uh, Jesus about healing on the Sabbath. And uh, I found a very nice book on Amazon by a credible academician. And I could read you the, the presses of that book. And it's, no, the Pharisees were for, you know, this was an active fight. We have literature going back into the Mac Maccabees. Mm -mm. That's, and this is part of a lot of things in the Greek Bible are, are just not credible. They're not. And, um, and I, I think I am not. The first book about the Josephite Messiah was printed in the past 20 years by a Christian. The first book that's actually devoted to this topic, right, was written within the last 20 years. I think there's a reason for that. I, I think that the Son of Man debate, which I stumbled on because I was I was arguing over, you know, things in the forum with, with Sam Adams, and I literally stumbled upon it because I know enough Aramaic to say, to know, you can't say son of man, capital S, capital M in Aramaic, right? Um, and, you know, and, and reading the Peshitta in, in Aramaic, made things a lot more clear to me in ways that I, I will gladly take hours to explain if necessary. But um, 
from my position, I think that there is a very coherent story, a narrative which is starting to reveal itself through the Dead Sea Scrolls, through the uncensoring of uh, Maimonides, through the scholarship that's being done, which is actually showing a very different story than Christians have been saying, uh, telling for 2000 years. And the crazy thing is that uh, there's a lot of people who are suddenly becoming God fearers hmm. the way they were 2000 years ago when some quarter to 50% of synagogue attendees were not Jewish. Yeah, yeah. And um, now Orthodox rabbis are being approached by people who want to be Noahides. They, they don't want to they, they don't want to become Jewish. They they want Noahide Judaism existed 2000 years ago. We have we have Acts 15. And suddenly it's existing again. And um, a lot of things are being thrown into Parhesia. <laughs> um, and that word, I, I, I think, is really, really important um, because God's plan, I believe, is coming to a culmination. And um, I, if, I, I think if people have the eyes to see and ears to hear, they, um, they can look at it and see there's a story being told and we're getting to the climax of the story hmm. and uh you know I, I i think the story's a lot clearer than 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 people want to think very interesting <laughs> <laughs> yes i am the guy with the sandwich board you you described the wa wa walking the, the end is coming well, I was just watching Jonathan Peugeot on Rebel Wisdom with uh, Evans, I think, and uh, Evans Evans sort of said something like, um, "Well, I think this will all this will all straighten out and things will be okay." And Jonathan Peugeot says, "I don't know." So <laughs> we've got a we've got a fair number of people walking around with sandwich boards and saying, "The end is near. The end is near." But but are you looking forward to it? Oh, I think so. Yes. Well, I the, the road may be bumpy, but well, the, the, of course the, the road is going to be bumpy. What'd you expect? Yeah. So, but I'm a, I'm a Christian. I think the apocalypse, the revelation is, is what we look forward to because it is the, it is the, also the consummation. It's the marriage of the, the bride and the bridegroom. So. And I think it's coming. Yep. And 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 I think we see the birth pangs, um, and and the Dead Sea Scrolls did not make the front pages. There's a lot of people who have no idea what the Dead Sea Scrolls are, but the the reverberations of that miracle, and I do believe it's a modern day miracle. Um, a lot of things have changed when. When I was in college, um, in undergrad, um, there was a professor um, of, of Old Testament studies or something like that, Biblical Hebrew. And um, I, I asked him some questions about the Dead Sea Scrolls. And this was only 20 years ago, 25 years ago. Um, and he said he he still didn't have access to them because he was Jewish. The the guy who who has them? They're, they're well now now Israel has them, but the guy who originally had them at Notre Dame and I again I believe this was got part of God's plan because there's always been. At, uh, some people within Christianity who believed 
that the rabbis had edited the Hebrew Bible, right? So the Masoretic text, and, and you still see it, people like that, the Masoretic text couldn't be trusted. Well, by some miracle, the first person to get the Dead Sea Scrolls at Notre Dame was a rabid anti-Semite. Hmm. And he was convinced that if he could, you know, get the truth out of these Dead Sea Scrolls, then it would show that the Masoretic text is, has been edited. So he would not let any Jews anywhere near the Dead Sea Scrolls until they were all photographed and the photographs were disseminated. And I think, I think that his rabid anti-Semitism was actually part of the miracle hmm. because Christians needed to have that type of assurance. No Jewish hands, no Jewish magic, no Jews involved, right? To see, nope, Masoretic text, still the best text we have and remarkably so, right? Um, I, I don't think anything happens just I don't believe in coincidences, right? Um, and and so no credible person, you know, it, it used to be people would say the Masoretic text was finalized, you know, uh, the Westminster Leningrad Codex is a thousand years old. So the Septuagint is much older and the original is the Septuagint and the Masoretic text is from the Septuagint. Um, the Dead Sea Scrolls has, has exploded a lot of myths. Um, and, and look, it, I believe it's, it is a miracle that my uncle Baruch is, who was born on the rivers of Babylon lives in Jerusalem right now, right? Um, and my monk, my uncle Mashiach, his name is Mashiach. Uh, um, but like, so I, I think there's a lot of miracles happening that too many people are not paying enough attention to. The Dead Sea Scrolls are a modern day miracle and they have verified the text of the Bible in a way that only a miracle like that could do. Hmm. And I don't believe it, it was just, it just happened that this Arab boy's goat went missing and, and he went and, you know, and suddenly he found these, you know, and there have been other discoveries and there continue to be discoveries. And so this is my biggest bit of woo. So you remember in, in, in the five books of Moses, uh, it says that uh, as they're crossing the, the river into the land, they're supposed to uh, put up these 12 stones and write the law on it clearly. I've been waiting for at least 20 years for, for those stones to be found. Because I don't think God just gave that commandment for no good reason. Um, and I, I expect those stones to be found. And can you imagine? Can you imagine? Yeah, that would be a big deal. <laughs> um, similarly, I, 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 I've been waiting for the gospel of the Hebrews to be found. Um, that's, that's the, possibly the text, well, it's the name of the text the Ebionites used. Hmm. Um, apparently it, it was either, it may have actually been Q, right? The, the, the proto text for the synoptic yeah. gospels, yeah. or it may, you know, the, the, most Christian belief is it was a translation 
into either Hebrew or Aramaic. But um, I, I could, I could see a a earlier version of the Gospels being found. Hmm. Wow, um, that, would be, that that would be that would be pretty jaw dropping. But isn't it jaw dropping that my uncle Baruch is in is in yeah, yeah. Jerusalem? Yeah, that is right. That is. Um, you know, there's that verse. Um, my my house will be called a house of prayer for all the nations. Yeah. Uh, two thousand year old text at least. If you have that type of real estate sense for what's going to happen in two thousand years, <laughs> look, there's a story here. There's a heroic story. There's a pattern. And that pattern is, is obvious to anybody who wants to see it, I believe. Um, there's a reason why there are billions of Christians and Muslims. Um, and the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, I believe, is, the, is both agent and arena, is both divine and meta divine um and is is working through history <laughs> maybe that's a good place to uh, a good place to land the plane okay yeah well good uh, any anything anything well why don't you mention your youtube channel um, so it's just my last name. I'll I'll put it in the com. Uh, I'll come in the comments and I'll and I'll uh, put a put a okay. link or something. Okay. Um, yeah, or Hebrew Bible in English. You can Google Hebrew Bible in English, um, and uh, most of it is just uh, just me going letter by letter through the Masoretic text for anybody. Like my, I started it as a project to get my mind off of politics and everything. And I figured, um, you know, this is something I can do that if somebody wants, you know, to go through letter by letter and, uh, you know, using the various websites and allow people to translate the Bible from Hebrew to themselves, for themselves. I, I thought that, you know, if I create this and upload it to YouTube, maybe, in God knows how many years, somebody wants to look up a verse, it'll be there. Um, and to my surprise, there there are enough people watching that I, I, I've been continuing to make videos. Good, yeah. good, good. Well, Jacob, it's it's always a pleasure to talk to you, and you do teach me a ton, and I do find your um, your challenges stimulating. And your um, so often your viewpoints uh, stimulating and refreshing, and and you're just you're just a lot of fun to have around. So I'm glad you're uh, you're you're hanging out on the Discord and stirring the pot. And um, well, I'm doing it for myself. Oh, I the reason that. the reason I'm there is because I get a lot out of it. Good, good, good. Well, I'm glad. So I, I will I will end the recording right now, but just formally want to thank you and to say that this, of course, is a pleasure. I'll I don't know my my scheduling's kind of crazy these weeks during the vacation um, and the and the holidays. So it'll it'll come out within a few days, I'm sure. Okay. All right. All right.